enjoy spackling, I guess. Oh, hell yeah, baby. I can't wait. I bought a spray gun for painting. We're going all out on my birthday. Hey, my name is Haney Malamet, just a guy who does some critical care and emergency medicine. All I want to tell people is just remember that they got to know the ventilator very, very well. Don't outsource this to respiratory. Respiratory is going to be a good ally for you. They're going to help you to learn the ventilator. When they're around, I certainly work with them. But the answer to the problem should never be just ask respiratory. You got to know your vents if you're going to be an awesome emergency medicine physician. Haney, I think for, for me personally, the most common vent alarm that I tend to see in the emergency department is this high pressure, high peak pressure alarm. What does that mean? What is the vent trying to tell me in that scenario? Peak pressure by itself just tells you that the overall pressure in the system is high. It doesn't help you to narrow things down. Peak pressure, just remember, is a combination of all the forces of the ventilator when it's pushing air into the person's lungs. So again, that's the resistance of airflow through the tube endotracheal tube, the trachea tube, the bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles, and it's also the forces of how stiff the lungs are, if there's any fluid around the lungs, if there's any um, um, lack of compliance of the chest wall. That's a summation. The next question you should ask is what's the plateau pressure? You need to find that plateau pressure next to help you to whittle things down. So when someone tells me, you know, Haney, the peak pressure is high, my next question is, well, what's the plateau pressure? I want everyone to walk away from this saying high peak pressures, your, your reflex, your knee jerk response should always be what's the plateau. Don't ever act on a peak pressure just by itself. The plateau pressure is when you ask the vent, hey, stop flow in the system that takes out resistance. All you have left is the compliance of the lung, which we assume is the only problem, but don't forget that chest wall can also be the problem as well. How do I determine the plateau pressure? Every ventilator has its own nuance to it. So I always, when I start a new job, I ask the respiratory therapist, hey, uh, this vent over here, show me how to do the inspiratory hold. But that's essentially what you're going to be doing. So the vent delivers a breath, and then you pause airflow. So you hold airflow, you close the valve on that vent, and now you're just seeing what the static pressure is, static because there's no airflow. Every machine will have its own nuanced way of doing it. And some machines actually determine that on a breath by breath. You just have to find the menu where that's listed out. So if I get called into the recess bay after I just intubated a patient and the vent starts beeping and I'm getting a high peak pressure alarm, uh, I did an inspiratory hold, there is a high plateau pressure. How do I approach this patient? High peak, high plateau, you know there's a problem with the compliance of the lungs. So I start to think about that realm of things. What could have caused suddenly to be a change? You know, if someone recently tried to put a central line in, did that person get a pneumothorax? That would cause a high plateau pressure because now you're ventilating a stiff lung. If the person got fluid after fluid bolts after fluid bolts, now their lungs really get soggy and bogged down with fluid. Now that lung is stiff. It's difficult to ventilate. Always a low threshold to take the ultrasound in the room. I'll look for the pleural spaces. Is there a big pleural effusion that's causing that lung to get constricted down to that thorax that's not expanding? If the peak pressure is high, and the plateau pressure is low, and I'm in the resistance box. Work your way down the tube. So you think about the ventilator. Is there a, a kink in the tubing of the ventilator? Is there a kink in the tube? Maybe that patient's not adequately, um, doesn't have enough analgesia, which is a common thing in the emergency department, and they're biting down on that tube. The tube got kinked in the back of the throat. So try to take one of those suction catheters, pass it through, and then think all the way down. Is there bronchoconstriction? Is there a mucus plug in there? Once you go down that rhythm like that, you'll figure out where the resistance is happening. But again, high peak, high plateau, it's a problem of compliance. It's the lungs. High peak, low plateau or normal plateau, then you're thinking it's a problem of the resistance in the tubes. How about the opposite alarm? How about the low pressure, low ventilation alarms? So low pressure means that there's a leak somewhere in the system. And for those types of things, I'll think about if the um, endotracheal tube has migrated above the cords and you know now the, the, the tube is inflated or the, the cuff is inflated, but air is getting around. Uh, it could be that the cuff is ruptured and there's a, a low pressure that way. You'd want to look at your inspiratory and expiratory volumes. It's a quick little trick you could do at the bedside. 
So what I do is I go when I have a low pressure alarm, I look at the inspiratory volume delivered and we'll pick a random tile volume of 400. So this person we picked is getting an inspiration of 400. You've determined that, you've set that on the ventilator. You have to be sure that the expiratory volume, the volume that's detected by the ventilator is 400. If it's less than 400, likely with the low pressure alarm, then there's a leak somewhere in the system because 400 is getting out of the patient, but it's just not getting back into the tube being detected by the ventilator. There's a leak in the system. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. <laughs>